Welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Eric Brynjolfsson and this is the Stanford Digital Economy Lunch Seminar. Um, we're delighted to have you join us today. We're very fortunate to have uh, two speakers who are gonna be talking about uh, AI globalization and strategies for economic development. Joe Stiglitz is a professor at Columbia University and he's an emeritus professor here at Stanford. I was just talking to him. He's been, I think he's done three stints at, at Stanford over the past uh, 20 or 30 years. Um, he's also the co-chair of the expert group on measurement and economic performance and social progress, the OECD, chief economist of the Roosevelt Institute, and has many other titles. Uh, most notably, he's known for his pioneering work on asymmetric information. And in 2001, he was recognized with a Nobel Prize uh, for that work. Anton Kornek was just promoted as of Friday, he tells me, uh, to full professor at University of Virginia in the Department of Economics and also the, Depart also the Darden School of Business. He's a research associate at the NBER, a fellow at SEPER, uh, an affiliate of the Oxford Future of Humanity Center for Governance and AI. He got his PhD at Columbia University. He's been a scholar uh, at Harvard, the World Bank, IMF, BIS, and numerous other locations. Both Joe and Anton have been doing a lot of work on AI and its implications for society. And in recent years, I've learned a lot from them. Uh, today, they're going to discuss uh, artificial intelligence, globalization, and strategies for economic development. I'm looking forward to a lively discussion with them and all of you can join in that discussion using the Q&A function uh, there. And uh, I think, uh, Christy, if you could put that into the chat, the link for people to use that. I'll be looking at your questions and pass them on to, uh, to Joe and Anton. And I believe they're also gonna leave uh, uh, 10 minutes or so at the end for, for general discussions. So welcome, Joe and Anton, please take it away. Well, welcome and thank you for this opportunity to, to talk to you. Uh, we're gonna be focusing in this talk about some of the uh, particular implications, concerns uh, that uh, AI has for uh, developing countries. And uh, the view that we're going to uh, articulate is that in fact, uh, there are some real genuine concerns that as bad uh, as, as troubling as AI may be for uh, inequality within countries, uh, the problems for uh, the differences uh, in well being across countries are greater, and that the tools that we have for remedying those uh, disparities are uh, less. Uh, and uh, Therefore, uh, there are uh, uh, real concerns. We'll talk about uh, some of the things that can be done about it. Uh, most of the talk is going to be, uh, you might say, a, a rather pessimistic view of some of the things that could go wrong uh, in a, as we uh, uh, advance uh, the overall ability of our societies to be more productive. Um, that those in the developing world, um, which have had a half century of convergence by and large, uh, may turn out to be disadvantaged. So uh, let me begin by uh, a brief uh, discussion about uh, some of the elements of, of uh, the general, uh, uh, what more generally is at issue. There are fears about uh, AI, uh, it, it, inducing large disruptions to our economy to be labor saving, which means that it will result in less demand for labor, lower wages, more unemployment, resource savings, important in uh, developing countries because many developing countries depend very heavily uh, on selling their natural resources. And um, that in some parts of the world, it's the only export and they will be uh, adversely affected. And finally, uh, one of the aspects of, of AI is that it is associated with uh, increase in market power, some of which is associated with uh, what are called superstar uh, effects, uh, what are called the winner take all effects, uh, um, which affect entire countries, uh, but also increase uh, uh, market power. And developing countries are affected uh, 
particularly affected by all of these. Next. Um, the slide, the next slide, who's controlling this? this oh, it, it is, is that uh, these effects are seen both uh, in data in terms of uh, quantities and prices. In terms of quantities, you can, uh, job polarization, um, you see the increase in jobs of uh, those requiring more skills and relative to those, the uh, stagnation of those uh, it, that don't require. And in terms of wages, uh, you see the similar kind of thing that the uh, non-routine uh, jobs that are non-routine and require cognitive skills, their demand is going up. Whereas uh, uh, those uh, non-routine uh, manual, for instance, are largely uh, stagnant. And that leads to a key policy question. Uh, how do we adapt to uh, these uh, potentially very disruptive changes? How do we improve the likelihood that uh, the outcome of this process is benign, that there is uh, shared prosperity, or at least not uh, uh, excessive increases of inequality, decreases of wages and incomes at the bottom. And um, the previous two charts show that the way innovation uh, has worked has worked to the advantage of certain parts of the population. And uh, the question is, can we steer innovation in ways that uh, mitigate these adverse effects and uh, direct more of the innovation, for instance, to saving the planet rather than replacing labor. Uh, and let me uh, uh, now talk about it in uh, very broad terms. The basic analytics is that technological change shifts out the economy's possibilities. And uh, one way of thinking about that is a concept that economists talk about called the factor price frontier. The maximum reward to one factor given what the other factors get paid. So that you fix the pay to any set of factors, innovation results in moving that other factors possibility out. That means that everybody could be better off, at least could be better off if you could make redistributions. The problem is that the market equilibrium may make some factors worse off. And uh, particularly that's true in the competitive market, but it's even worse once we recognize that there may be monopoly power uh, that um, uh, that it, it can uh, distort the economy from the competitive equilibrium in such a way as to result in some factors getting even more better off. Hey, Joe, could you give a, a sort of a, a simple example, a real world example of something like that happening? Oh, sure. I mean, the, what, what has been going on in uh, what we in, in COVID-19 what we've been seeing is Jeff Bezos is doing very well. Uh, he's appropriating. No, no, but that, that, I don't, that, that's an example where, I mean, arguably the, the whole economy took kind of a hit and some got better and worse. Uh, can, can you give an example where the whole economy got better off, yet some people made, were made worse off? Oh, the, if you go back to the earlier charts, we saw that the workers, right. workers in particular, those without a high school degree, uh, uh, are doing worse off today. Right, so, despite the fact that the economy is bigger, there's more millionaires and billionaires than ever. Exactly. And you see that in other countries, in India, there are now more, you know, lots more billionaires, but the economy has been o generating almost no new jobs in the formal sector that while we, everybody talks about the great achievement of the Indian economy, they forget that it's, uh, the beneficiaries are a small slice and that uh, a lot of people who are Indian farmers are actually haven't been doing very well. 
and some of them are actually worse off. So those are examples. Um, what one wants to understand what is going on, and there are what I've tried to do in this slide is to emphasize there are two factors going on. One of them is that if innovation saves on labor, it decreases the demand for labor, and that's going to decrease wages or increase unemployment. So that's the workings of the normal market economy. No, no theory. There's nothing about the workings of the market economy says, that says that innovation will make everybody better off. That the market, competitive market equilibrium, it can make some people worse off. And the second one is that new technologies create market power, and that enables some groups to seize an even larger share of the GDP of the income and to gain at the expense of others. So uh, it's, it's a movement away from the competitive to one where a few grab more and more. And so that's really the, you might say, the, the uh, basic story that applies to both developed and developing countries. And we've laid this out in one of our earlier papers. Next slide. But there are some whole list of special challenges facing developing countries that make it worse. And uh, I've listed them uh, here. One of them is that their comparative advantage is in uh, unskilled labor, natural resources, and that AI may decrease the returns to these factors. Within a country, there can be redistributions to protect the losers from the, these redistributive effects, but cross-country redistributions are just more limited. So the likelihood that one can wind up where uh, whole countries or groups within a country are worse off is just much larger. And then because of the uh, market power, large ranks may go to those uh, advanced countries that dominate in AI. And that's really the big concern, in, we'll come to a little bit later, that uh, uh, Amazon, Google, uh, Facebook are going to be taking out, you can call it ranks, out of poor countries, and uh, that will be going into uh, uh, rich countries. So it's a redistribution from the poor countries to the rich. And the inadequacies in the global tax regime make it difficult for the developing countries to recapture that. Big issue going on right now uh, uh, around the world and in the United States. Uh, Secretary Yellen has emphasized the need for a uh, global minimum corporate income tax. If we have time, I'll talk about how important that initiative is. But right now, uh, it's been really difficult for developing countries to uh, appropriate even, uh, uh, we might say, uh, a fraction of the ranks that are, uh, of the prof of, of the value of the economic activities that accrue in those countries. And uh, finally, uh, one of the things that has benefited developing countries enormously, and why there has been a convergence over the last 50 years. China, India, um, is that uh, they, there's been a process of catching up. And it's, uh, that process is associated with export, manufacturing export-led uh, development. But uh, catching up may become much more difficult. And uh, that means you know, what separates developing from developed countries is not just a gap in resources, a gap in knowledge, and the gap in knowledge may increase, and that will in turn lead to uh, greater uh, disparities um, uh, in incomes. So uh, going forward, uh, unfortunately, uh, prospects uh, may be even more bleak. Uh, the worst case 
uh, scenario is that there will be an unraveling of the gains from globalization uh, for the poor countries, uh, almost a return to the Malthusian world. Um, but the advanced countries are not going to be immune from the consequences. Uh, just think of uh, the instability of the Middle East where uh, incomes are going down because the natural resources they have, oil, does not have much value. And uh, the part of the world where almost all the population growth is, is Africa. And uh, if their prospects of closing the gap in their incomes with the West, with the more advanced countries is de minimis, then one can anticipate strong migratory pressures uh, and uh, that'll have to be dealt with. Uh, I'm not, we're not gonna talk about uh, a broader, very much a broader set of problems that AI poses for all countries, including the developing countries. There's broader harms of AI associated with uh, cybersecurity, privacy, price discrimination, hate speech, incitement, political manipulation. Um, but there's one aspect that uh, developing countries are concerned about. That is that the regime, the regulatory regime to prevent these harms is likely to be set in the banks countries and in China, putting the developing countries at a disadvantage. And yet the abuses may be larger in the develop, uh, uh, developing countries. Um, Anton, do you want to pick up from here? Thank you, Joe. So let me talk a little bit about how uh, we think about evaluating these risks. And let me very much emphasize that uh, the worst case scenarios that Joe has talked about are not necessarily our medium scenarios, but are uh, what we try to analyze uh, to kind of crystallize how large the dangers are uh, of letting uh, AI uh, just run loose without setting in place uh, the right institutional structures. And uh, so against that background, uh, we now want to evaluate uh, the likelihood of the different scenarios and then focus on what policy responses uh, we would recommend. So first on this question, uh, of whether AI disruption is a tail risk or a likely scenario. Uh, well, if we look at current data, uh, we have seen in the graphs that Joe showed before that there have been some indications that uh, technological progress over the past few decades has indeed been labor saving for some categories of workers, and that has hurt them quite significantly. Now, um, we, we are not technology experts, so we, we don't have any specific technological predictions, but in light of what we have seen in the past few decades, we think that the fear is justified that uh, if we just let things uh, continue to run as they have over the past few decades, that type of inequality may get even worse. Uh, but what we as economists really do want to emphasize is that the outcome of technological progress is not uh, dictated by technology, but it's really a result of the interplay of technology and the institutional setting, the rules of the uh, game, uh, market power, intellectual property rights. And we will talk about this more systematically in the coming slides. So a simple way of thinking about it is our technology dictates how much we can produce. And our system of institutions determines how what we pr produce is distributed across society, distributed to workers versus entrepreneurs uh, versus the owners of capital and so on. A third point uh, that we want to emphasize is that at present, and at least for the next decade or so, uh, there are in fact very large needs for public investments, uh, we want to highlight in particular investments uh, necessary for the green transition. And given the state of our technology, human workers are very much needed 
so we see uh, there actually uh, to be a great potential for increasing labor demand, uh, engaging in the right set of policies uh, that will basically channel uh, all the workers that we have into meeting all these needs that our society has, needs uh, for the green transition and so on. So we have in fact um, uh, a separate slide that is dedicated to this question on technology and the green transition, because we found it's really interesting to highlight both the similarities and the differences between uh, standard technological progress like advances in AI and the need for a green transition. So what is a similarity between the two? Well, both of them will involve large changes in relative prices that will generate large redistributions. Uh, for example, uh, if we make our economy more carbon friendly, the producers of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, carbon-based fuels, think, for example, coal miners stand to lose a great deal if we don't compensate them. So in that sense, uh, the need for a green transition is very similar to resource saving innovation once we account for the economic externalities, the environmental externalities generated uh, by, for example, fossil fuels. Uh, but, and I think uh, that's uh, kind of a crucial distinction between the two, the green transition is actually likely to really increase demand for labor. Uh, it is more likely to be labor using, whereas advances uh, in AI are more likely to be uh, either neutral or labor saving, meaning that they would reduce labor demand, reduce uh, wages or employment. So in some sense, we find that these two big societal challenges, uh, they really balance each other in a certain way, freeing the resources uh, that technological progress makes redundant actually allows us to better address the challenges of climate change. So um, if we look at uh, the lessons of past technological uh, transformations for the future, think for example, the industrial revolution, uh, when uh, weavers uh, and spinners and so on got displaced, uh, one of the big lessons is that even if the uh, technological change is ultimately beneficial, disruptions along the way can be very large, can last for generations, and they bring with them a huge amount of social and political upheaval. However, what we have also learned by looking at past technological uh, revolutions is that collective action, uh, government action, can mitigate the effects. Now, is this time going to be the same or is it going to be different from previous uh, transitions? Well, um, what we found uh, was that even though the Industrial Revolution uh, really created large disruptions, we know that ultimately, if we look at the mid 20th century, for example, it did lead to a more egalitarian society. The fear is uh, that AI will not so much be labor using and increase demand for workers, but could in fact have the opposite effect. Um, so that means that the ultimate destination, if we just let the free market rule, may become much less attractive than what the industrial revolution led to. And that really emphasizes the crucial role uh, of collective action of government uh, action to make sure that we share the gains from progress uh, in an egalitarian way. So uh, let, me, let me perhaps hand back to Joe again now. So the, the critical issue here is, uh, will government be able to play the same role uh, that it did uh, in, in the past? Um, and so 
Uh, let me talk just for a minute about what some of those roles that the government played uh, in the past. Uh, first, it, it played a, a role in basic research uh, and in mitigating the adverse effect. Uh, in terms of mitigating the adverse effects, uh, it uh, uh, um, had a positive effect in promoting education, which at the time was particularly in the interest of capitalists. In fact, part of the argument for why we developed public education was that having a well-educated citizenry, workers, was important. And so you had a coincidence of interest between the new capitalists and the workers and having more education, and it worked. Not clear this time that it will be the same. Um, the uh, development beginning with Bismarck of, of the social safety net uh, at the end of the 19th century, uh, the uh, a whole host of, of um, uh, uh, social and market legislation, unions, collective bargaining, uh, so all of these had the effect that the world that was depicted uh, by Dickens, for instance, uh, you know, 50 years on in the Industrial Revolution, by the middle of the 20th century was one in which we had much more of a middle, we talked about a middle class society and, and a kind of shared prosperity. Uh, but it, we, we, we have to remember it was, a, it was a hard battle. And if you think about the, the bitter strikes at the beginning of the 20th century uh, and uh, how difficult it was even to get unemployment insurance through uh, by FDR uh, in uh, the Great Depression and how difficult it was to get uh, government to do anything about the massive unemployment with most American economists saying, just leave it to the market as 25 as the unemployment rate reached 25%. So um, it's clear that uh, today uh, those roles don't have the kind of support uh, that, or at least there's the same, there's a lot of conflict about the uh, uh, ability of the government to perform those roles. So the government played uh, two complementary roles. It supported the structural transformation uh, and uh, that, that role was actually important and uh, necessary, you might say, politically to sustain social peace and democracy. Um, and uh, it ushered in an age of, uh, we sometimes call it the age of labor. Um, but as we've seen in recent years, uh, all of that has become uh, very greatly uh, uh, contested. So uh, the, um, uh, so that leads to the next question. Um, as we move to a world of AI, will the government be able to undertake what may be an even larger role. Um, and uh, the um, worry is that in fact, the greater inequality that is associated with AI may have itself political consequences with less support for collective action, more, uh, uh, less support for more egalitarian policies, uh, less support for uh, social protection. So uh, that is part of the concern that there is a, a uh, in the 19th century, there was a virtuous circle where uh, it was in the interest of business leaders to promote education and uh, uh, a greater degree of harmony through safety nets, social protection policies. And uh, now the increasing inequality is setting up a vicious circle where uh, more inequality leads to uh, uh, more political inequality, which leads to policies that support more economic inequality. 
So, Joe, if I could, uh, there, there are a number of questions coming in, uh, a lot of interesting questions, uh, which most of which we'll take a little later, but one of them is very much on, on this topic. So maybe I'll, I'll, I'll uh, pass it on now. Uh, Marco uh, Grobelinik um, notes that AI innovations are in, have a very fast pace and maybe perhaps will be increasing more rapidly. And, and then he adds in a, in a related question, um, will the speed of innovations, um, how does that affect the pace of, will the regulatory uh, efforts be able to keep pace with the speed of innovations? And is that a concern as well? Well, I think the answer is yes, it is a concern that uh, at the broad macroeconomic level that most of our discussion has been today, uh, the answer is uh, it's not that big of a concern. If we have in place the appropriate uh, rules of the game, uh, the mechanisms of redistribution, uh, the mechanisms of, of uh, labor legislation, mm -hmm. it will work pretty well. There are a couple areas where we're going to talk about in a second where it doesn't. Competition policy. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, in a lot of the AI, uh, the, the, the harms I mentioned uh, very briefly uh, before, like uh, incitement, political manipulation, the regulatory framework has been badly lagging. Mm -hmm. uh, in some of those areas, that's a real problem. We're catching up, but it's been a real struggle. And uh, the, the uh, political economy of devising those regulations is even more complex than normal. Um, they're, they're, the the um, uh, fact that the digital giants are lo mostly located in the United States uh, means that actions which are might be viewed as just reasonable actions curbing anti-competitive practices, our previous president said were anti-American. They weren't. Uh, most economists would say, yes, they're, they're what you expect if you uh, need, if you're going to have anti-competitive, if you're going to have pro-competitive policies, uh, effective antitrust. But there get, is an it, it interplay between uh, 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 regulatory framework and, and this global issues. We'll come back to that a little later. Okay, great. Um, so let me talk a little bit about uh, the role for uh, economic policy. Uh, there are two broad categories of policies, domestic and global policies. And uh, because AI is to such extent a, a global, uh, you can't address these issues without thinking about global policies. And to a large extent, global policies are increasingly circumscribing what national governments can do. Uh, but we're going to begin with our discussion with the domestic policies, and then Anton will talk a little bit more about some of these uh, global policies. Um, the, or did you want to pick it up here, Anton? Uh, I, I'm, I'm happy to. So, so in the context of the domestic policies, uh, and we will focus on that in the next few slides, uh, we, we will talk about the fact that developing countries will really need new development strategies. The old strategies of uh, exporting goods manufactured with cheap labor just won't work anymore if robots can do the same thing even more cheaply. We will talk a little bit about redistribution and then uh, something that has received uh, increasing attention over the past decade in economics, uh, which is pre-distribution. And uh, I think Joe will then round it out with the discussion of the global policies that we should worry about uh, that are particularly relevant for developing countries. And those include, first of all, a global tax regime, uh, global competition policy, intellectual property rights, and also data and information policies. So let's focus on um, domestic policies first. And um, first uh, about the uh, 
uh, intellectual property policies, the role of the patent system. Uh, so in principle, uh, one of the uh, important questions in shaping how the benefits of progress are distributed is whether everybody has access to it. Now, our current patent system uh, is designed specifically to restrict access to innovations. And for developing countries uh, that can have uh, disastrous consequences. Uh, one example, not in the context of AI, uh, that we can see that is particularly acute these days, are intellectual property rights on the COVID vaccines. Uh, so uh, if the poorest countries in the world uh, had access to a vaccine uh, without having to pay rents uh, to the owners of the intellectual property, we as uh, humanity, uh, we as uh, basically the global community could probably get the virus under control much more quickly. So, and Anton, can, can I just pause there? Because I mean, you and Joe both use the word rents um, to AI and to, to, the, um, pat, to the vaccine development. Um, how are you distinguishing between rents versus incentives or returns for creating new products? So um, do, you, do you want to say a little bit about wh wh when it's rents versus when it's an incentive yeah. for the creation of a valuable new good that wouldn't occur without the incentives? That, that's a so very a uh, little point. more precise there. I mean, yeah. uh, I mean less technical. Um, there are a lot of people who would argue that that you need to give rewards to innovators to create wonderful things, and that if you took those rewards away, then they wouldn't create them in the future. Uh, yeah, and, and we completely agree with that in principle. So the definition of a rent is that it is essentially what you collect above uh, the regular market return uh, on your investment. And you can earn these rents, for example, if you have a dominant market position, uh, if you uh, if you don't have perfect competition, and especially in the context of AI, uh, we know that most producers have, uh, by the nature of AI, a dominant market position. So that's why what they are earning is above the market return on their capital invested. And that's why we're speaking of rents. And we don't want to expropriate AI engineers. Uh, we just want to share their rents, the return above the normal market return more broadly so, across society. So let me uh, make that yeah. in the context of the COVID-19 vaccine, the proposal that is uh, being discussed at the WTO is that uh, the owners of the intellectual property rights be compensated at a reasonable return on their investment. Uh, so they, it's not eliminating the intellectual property rights, but it's saying that there's a normal, uh, that there's a normal fee, but those, but, but it's accessible to everybody. And so you get competition in production, but rewarding the innovators. Uh, and, uh, that's the fundamental distinction. The drug companies, obviously want monopoly rents and so they're pushing back but it's not about whether they will get you know they'll get a thousand percent return on their investment they think that they want a hundred thousand percent return okay okay so and uh, now moving on from from our discussion of the patent system, we, we, we do want a fair return, but we don't want monopoly returns, right? Uh, the second point uh, in the context of pre-distribution that we want to emphasize is that progress is very much endogenous. Uh, it is at least at this point still us humans who decide uh, in which direction we want to focus our innovative efforts, what we want to invent. And we can see that, for example, in the context of green technologies, where uh, just over uh, the past uh, year, uh, I might say, uh, we have suddenly really realized how important it is uh, to uh, steer progress in the direction uh, of uh, essentially inventions that will help us uh, to 
save the planet uh, to contain global warming. Uh, and what we want to propose is uh, that we should make that type of effort also when we design AI systems. We should steer progress in the direction of AI systems uh, that will enhance labor supply, uh, that will complement humans as opposed to just focusing on substituting and displacing humans. Uh, now, and a very related point is that uh, there are a myriad of policies that our government already is engaging in that have a really important effect on whether innovation focuses more on complementing labor or substituting labor. So for example, by keeping the price of capital artificially low, uh, by keeping interest rates really low, um, we have effectively subsidized capital and made labor comparatively more expensive, thereby encouraging the displacement of labor. Now, our science policies can also affect in which direction innovation goes. And uh, obviously, one of the main aims of our climate policies is uh, to make our economy uh, less carbon intensive. So a few quick words on redistribution, and I will uh, maybe hurry a little bit on this slide because we are already uh, running short on time. Yeah, there are a lot, um, of, quite a lot of very interesting questions that I'd love to pass on to you, but I also want to give you a chance to finish. Yeah, uh, so uh, one of the uh, standard uh, toolkits uh, of economists uh, when it comes to mitigating inequality, mitigating those adverse effects are simply redistribution policies. So we need progressive taxation. Uh, we uh, essentially don't want uh, the those who have been lucky and who have uh, earned uh, far greater returns than others in the economy uh, to not share that with the rest uh, of uh, society. We need more creative capital ownership models. We need to focus on how all our uh, governmental expenditures uh, affect labor demand. So uh, I think there's great scope and we can see that in the infrastructure packages that are now being discussed uh, by the Biden administration, for example, there's great scope for uh, consciously choosing expenditures uh, that will also add to labor demand as opposed to just building more machines. And um, one, uh, one quick side note on a universal basic income, uh, perhaps one day in the future, if labor truly becomes redundant, a UBI will be the only way uh, of distributing resources to people. But for now, and uh, in particular over the next decade, we believe that the focus should be very much on creating jobs for everyone who is able and willing to work. Can I ask now, you a question about the, the, the current policy to, to have equate the rates of taxation on capital and labor rate, the capital gains tax, the same as the uh, labor income tax? Would, would that be consistent with your recommendations? So it would certainly go in the right direction. You think it should be uh, higher, or how? What, how would you would you like to say a a, a, a specific proposal? Oh, well, uh, I, I, I maybe I, I'm a little bit more aggressive probably than Anton would be. What I would say is that the capital gains on land and natural resources should be as close to 100 percent as possible, and or it should be higher than labor. Uh, the land tax, yes, the land tax, it, yeah. The basic point is you don't get more land because land is more, uh, taxed at a lower rate. There are so no goes back to our rent point. You, you don't need incentives to, to create more land. Exactly. This is a very old point that Henry George made, a great 19th century economist that seems to be constantly forgotten. And the fact is the irony is in the 2017 law, they lowered the tax on the one area of capital uh, area they should have been raising it, which is real estate. Um, so it, it was moving in exactly the wrong direction um, from what we should have been going. Not a surprise, but that's where we were. And what about uh, what about regular capital gains on you know investments in companies? Should they be higher, lower, or the same as uh, as labor? Uh, let me perhaps argue uh, a point on that from the perspective of arbitrage. Uh, 
uh, if you earn, let's say, a billion dollars a year, uh, you can afford pretty good lawyers. And so maybe that argues that uh, they should be the same. But what I would argue is it should be much more progressive. Uh, there is no reason why progressivity should end where it does now. Maybe people above 500 million should pay a higher tax rate than those below 500 million. And the same for 1 billion and so forth. Yeah, I would agree. And I would add one more thing, which is the corporate income tax is really a corporate profits tax. It's a corporate rent tax because labor and capital, capital costs are deductible. And so that's a tax that should be actually at a very high rate on the principle that rents should in general be taxed at a higher rate. And in fact, you some of those ranks are monopoly ranks, and you want to discourage efforts to try to become a monopolist. So it would actually increase the efficiency of the economy by taxing corporate profits at a higher rate. Okay, so we have about 10 minutes. So I want to let you guys a chance to do your last couple of slides. And then there are, there are 20 questions. So we'll try to get to a few of them. Yeah, let me perhaps hand back to Joe to talk a little bit about information policy and then show I'll let you uh you, you'll instruct me when to go to the next slide yeah, I'm, we're gonna I, I, we don't have much time so uh, this was the issue that actually was the one area where regulatory policy is really finding it difficult keeping up with uh the innovation uh that is uh, occurring and uh uh there are lots of concerns about uh, abuses that I mentioned, we mentioned er earlier in the talk. Um, and uh, the question, uh, it, it, the easiest areas is, uh, are in new competition policies to uh, need for stronger rules preventing conflicts of interest, uh, pre uh, stronger rules preventing preemptive mergers, um, uh, more ex post remediation, breaking up mergers when they prove to be anti competitive. Uh, there's a lot of uh, um, confusion. Uh, people talking about uh, First Amendment, uh, 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 free speech, and all that. There's no constitutional right to virality. And the basic point is that there's no absolute First Amendment. Uh, we always say uh, you can't cry fire in a crowded theater. You're always balancing public interest versus uh, these other rights. And the point is that as the uh, likelihood of harms increase, how you balance those change. And that's going to be a very important issue. Can I ask a question about the monopoly? I mean, there are, with network effects and economies of scale, there are some some natural monopolies. I'm not sure it would be helpful to have you know a dozen different Facebooks that. No, no. I, so, so, that, so how would, how do you address that sort of inherent monopoly? Um, yeah. So with, there, the the issue is uh, anti-competitive behavior. It's it's a different antitrust world. You're not going to uh, and and by that, uh, that's where the issues of rules preventing conflicts of interest. Uh, it, the rules preventing uh, um, uh, re regulating information uh, and how you what you do with information, but for instance, the kinds of actions that the, have been taken in in the EU, where uh, they've uh, 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 attacked the use of by Google of uh, and Amazon and Facebook. Uh, certain practices of those have been attacked. So it's not trying to split up that, but directed at particular kinds of action that Google, Facebook, and Amazon have engaged in that are anti-competitive in nature. And we can go through those. Let me go through a couple of the slides very quickly and then, yep. and then open it up broadly to question. I want to... Um, uh, uh, emphasize that developing countries face a whole set of uh, challenge, special challenges. Uh, what, a couple of you already mentioned the fact that there's going to be 
um, redistributions, uh, but that within the, the, the redistributions uh, within a country are very different than redistributions between countries. And uh, many of the developing countries are going to be absolutely worse off. And that isn't, has nothing to do with the mobility of factors within the country. They could be a very dynamic developing country, but the fact is that the assets that they have have gone down in value. And yeah. that's going to be- um, Yeah, so uh, let, me, let me, I'm gonna try and work in some questions with the appropriate, when you make a, a point here. So, so Yurgos Petropoulos um, uh, asks, that, can, AI, can AI also provide new avenues of interaction between developing and developed countries? For instance, AI and digital technologies can help with machine translation, new platform for projects, enable more offshoring. Um, and he goes on in that. But you know, th there's also some people make an argument that we're going to see more factor price equalization, that, that workers in the United States will be in competition with workers in India and other countries through these platforms. There was a, a, a paper a, a little while ago about uh, machine translation dramatically improving ability for these interactions. Um, does that go in the other direction, or how would you balance those kinds of uh, forces? Well, I think you're right. There, there are some of those that are going on. Uh, and uh, the question is uh, net what is going to be, so it's going to open up opportunities. The monopoly is closing off opportunities, but uh, I think our judgment is that the first order effect is reflected in asset prices. And by that, I mean, what is the price of unskilled labor what is the price of the natural resources in which developing countries uh, have a lot of endowment? And you see that going down. And that's going down. So yes, there are lots of things going on. Particular individuals in developing countries will do better. If you're an engineer in India and you can sell your services in the United States, the factor price equalization theorem is gonna be helping you. And so the, what you're doing there is overcoming our visa barriers. Uh, so those are examples where, where, where uh, those with those particular skills are going to be better off. Uh, but the question is, by and large, what is the asset base? And, um, and you can say, to the extent that within India, you can tax those engineers a little bit more. It can help the very poor within India a little bit, but that's where our judgment about where the, the asset base, what is the wealth of the country as a whole, uh, that's going the wrong way. And uh, that's where the, the other point we made about uh, the increased difficulty of closing the knowledge gap. The, undermining the export manufacturing export leg growth model is going to play out in a, in a over the medium term in a very uh, uh, difficult way. And so, um, well, there's going to be a need to construct an alternative multi-prong strategy. I've tried to lay out what that strategy might look like. Uh, I think there are, do exist these strategies, but my sense of that is that they are second best strategies. That's that they're going to be much harder, and uh, that highlights the importance of technology transfer for closing the knowledge gap, and uh, that brings me to let me just say a, a final set of closing remarks. Uh, we were going to talk about more broadly some of the the uh, uh, global policies, the cross country dimensions that affect uh, uh, what uh, uh, the, the impact on developing countries. But the global rules, whether it's the tax regime or the competition policy or the IPR policy, are going to be set by the advanced countries under current uh, uh, international framework. And the question is, to a large extent, they're being set for and by the rich, powerful companies in the powerful countries. And that will be to the detriment of the developing countries. 
So the example that we're seeing right now, I don't want to harp back on it, but it is obviously in the news, the fact that our drug companies are fighting so hard to resist the initiative at WTO for the waiver of intellectual property rights for COVID-19, even though the principle has already been accepted internationally that in the presence of a pandemic, you have the right to issue compulsory license, the data the, 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 the intellectual property protections are waived through, they wanna make it as cumbersome and difficult. Meanwhile, letting people die by the tens of thousands. And so that's a really vivid example of how the rules are set for the advanced countries. And even somebody whose heart is as warm as Biden has not yet been able to, to make the right move because of the pressure of the pharmaceutical companies. So we, we do have a few questions um, and we just have a minute or two. Let me, um, let me just, so, so one question is uh, we've, Mostly you've been focusing on North versus South. Another way is East versus West. And, and you touched on this a little bit, but uh, there's a question, will the imposition of restrictions on data use and monopoly power put Western companies at a competitive disadvantage vis-a-vis -vis large Chinese tech players that are not as may not as be constrained by similar regulations? And, and what are your thoughts about that dimension? Well, I've been worried about that. And uh, that goes to lots of issues like uh, even research on drugs. Uh, it, it, to the extent you can use AI to do research and you right. have better DNA base uh, and you're looking at DNA based drugs, uh, they may have a competitive advantage. Now, in some sense, um, you can say the whole world may benefit from having better drugs. That's a public good. And the advance of knowledge is a public good. So in that direction, you, you can say, well, you know, the fact that China decided to spend a lot of its money developing solar panels, we've all benefited from that. Right. It may have been industrial policy, but we've benefited. Um, the broader issue that a lot of people in China and Europe talk about is they the point is that we have surveillance by the private sector china has surveillance by the public sector and a lot of people in europe don't want surveillance at all so they're saying um are we being put at a disadvantage by the u.s willingness to have uh, such a surveillance economy and so that issue is actually a broader issue in uh, defining what should be the rules of the international game with respect to uh, these new technologies. And um, I'm thinking, I think that we may uh, wind up in certain areas deciding that it is an unfair trade advantage and you need to compensate for it by trade policy. Yeah. Well, I regret that we are out of time. This has been absolutely fascinating. Uh, one real quick question. Um, a person, uh, we didn't have to go through some of your slides quickly, asked, would it be possible to share the slides, uh, including the ones that were not presented? Would that be okay? Yes, okay, thumbs up from Anton. And let me just say, uh, this, is, this has been terrific. A lot of uh, uh, really good uh, analysis, but also uh, actionable advice. Uh, both of you have done some really important work on trade policy in the past, and I see some some parallels where you can make the pie bigger, but if you don't compensate people, you get you get bad outcomes and and, and backlash, and uh, maybe uh, the world will take heed more to some of your advice uh, this time because I don't think we did it as well the last time around. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, very much appreciate you sharing your research. We, we'll put your paper and your slides up available. And I just want to uh, let all the folks listening in that next week, we're going to have Rafaela Sadan from Harvard coming in. She's going to be talking about the demand for executive skills. Uh, thanks again, Joe. Thanks, Anton. It was a real pleasure having you join us. Thank you, Eric.